Hello, and welcome to this webinar presented by the Pennsylvania MGMA in collaboration with the Connecticut, Delaware, Delaware Maryland, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, and Virginia MGMA. My name is Alyssa Edding, and I'll be your host. Today's presentation is led by Tyler Enslin. Tyler Enslin is the National Director of Direct Development Training, a company dedicated to providing tailor-made training to help businesses thrive like never before. With over 200 speaking engagements a year for a multitude of industries, Tyler has received outstanding recognition by those in his audience, which has enabled him to work with state and national agencies across the country. From Fortune 500 companies and large organizations like GlaxoSmithKline, Johns Hopkins, Sinclair Broadcast Group, and Long & Foster to hundreds of, hundreds of small groups. Tyler rarely passes, passes on an opportunity to get his message across. Before we get started, I would like to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's webinar. The viewer window is on the right and it allows you to see everything the presenter is sharing. The control panel is on the left and that is how you can participate in the webinar. The audio panel provides audio information. By default, you have joined the webinar using microphone and speakers. If you prefer, you can join the audio using your telephone by selecting Use Telephone under the audio drop-down box. The dial-in information will be displayed, including the audio pin. During the presentation, you have the ability to send questions to our staff through the chat box found on the left side of your screen. Simply type in your question and click Send. At the end of the presentation, we will do a question and answer session. As a final reminder, we are recording today's webinar. You can view a copy of this presentation and recording on the, participation, on the participating MGMA websites. Please welcome Tyler Enslin with Achievement Now, the Success Characteristics. Thank you, Alyssa. And uh, I'm looking at the attendee list here. I see 54 of you have joined. I'm sure we'll add a few more to that. So thank you all for uh, being on this webinar. And I know it's Friday afternoon at 2.30 taking some, some time out of your Friday to, uh, to be with us. So our topic today, Achievement Now, Success Characteristics. Obviously, we're going to talk a lot about goals. Um, let's begin with a question. If you had to guess, when do you think is the time of year that the average person, average American, sets their goals? If you said January 1st, New Year's resolution, you're 100% correct. In fact, a, a recent study uh, done in 2016 found that still 64% of Americans set some kind of New Year's resolution. They set a goal every year, at least one, uh, around January 1st. Interestingly enough, for that 64%, typically they say that's the only time of year that they set any kind of goals. So we're labeling this New Year's resolutions, but for a lot of people, these are their only goals for the year. Here's, here's a better question, a more relevant question uh, to our discussion today. What percentage of New Year's resolutions do you think actually get reached or get achieved? The study found 8%. So I don't know about you, but when I read that, it was kind of depressing. It's like, man, 64% of people, this is the only time of year they set any kind of goals. If that number is anywhere near correct, that's over 200 million Americans, and only 8% of them achieve what they set out to do. In other words, we have a 92% failure number when it comes to these goals. Now, here's the next logical question. Why is the failure number so high? And I ask this question to live audiences uh, all around the country. I get a variety of answers. Usually the first answer I get, unrealistic goals. People say, man, the people set New Year's resolutions, and they're just not realistic. That's true. I was uh, working with a, a group of people in DC not long ago, and I asked uh, them to write down a list of their goals. One of the first people I look at, this guy wrote his goal, first goal, to win the Powerball. That's not realistic. You can't control that. I look over another guy, he writes, to marry a supermodel. Not a realistic goal. I think the, the first guy had a better chance of winning the Powerball, and the other one did to marry a supermodel, but that's another discussion. So unrealistic goals is a big reason. Some people set goals and they don't have any plan to achieve it. It just sounds good. Hey, other people are setting goals. I should set one, but no real plan. Others have no accountability. Others set goals that are too vague, too general. We could go on. That being said, the big reason why people fail, it boils down to one simple thing. And let's just say 
for the sake of argument that I set a goal and it is realistic, it is the right size, it is specific, I do have a plan, I have some accountability, and I still fail to achieve it. I don't know if it's happened to you. I know it's happened to me plenty of times. It almost always boils down to this one very simple thing, and uh, it's a statement. I'm going to put it up on the, on the screen here for you. We sacrifice what we want most in life for what we want now. Now, that is a very simple statement, but that is what most failure to achieve goals boils down to. We have a tendency to sacrifice the things that we want most in life for the things that we want right now. So let me give you an example, a common goal people set, uh, especially around New Year's, right? I I'd like to lose weight. I'd like to get in better shape. You know what? My goal is to lose 10 pounds or 15 pounds or 20 pounds. That's my goal. But right now, what I really want is a cheeseburger. Man, I'm hungry. And I don't want to go to the gym on my lunch break. My lunch break. I want to eat. We sacrifice what we want most, long-term success, for what we want right now. I want to get out of debt. I want to pay credit cards off. That's another goal. But, but I, don't, I don't want to stop spending money. Right now, I want to go shopping. I want to go out to eat. So we sacrifice the things we want most, long-term success for the things we want now, short-term comfort. And this is, it's human nature. It's happened to almost all of us at one time or another, and we don't do it consciously. No one sits there and thinks, man, do I want the... Uh, cheeseburger or the donut right now, or do I want to look good come Memorial Day? It's not a conscious choice, but subconsciously it happens all the time. Successful people, people who are in the habit of high achievement, they've trained themselves to do the exact opposite of this. They are willing to sacrifice short-term comforts to make sure they're successful long-term. Hey, I will be a little uncomfortable right now to make sure I get what I want, what means most to me. Uh, in the long run. So that's a simple statement, but keep that statement in mind as we go through our, our training today. So to set the stage for our discussion, um, I'd like you to just take a moment and try to think of at least one goal that you currently have for yourself right now. Um, those of you who are in an office or are at home, if you're at a desk, I encourage you to write this goal down. If you're driving, we definitely don't want you to write it down. But if you're in a position to, just take a moment and think of something you'd like to achieve in the relatively near future. And just jot it down. It could be a personal goal. It could be a business goal, um, a health goal, a relationship goal. If you're in a position to write it down, please do so. If you're not, have it clearly in mind. This will sort of set the stage as, as something that you can filter a lot of the information through that we talk about today. Make sure it's something that would be meaningful to you and would have a positive impact on your life if you got it done. And I'll give you a few more seconds here to come up with one. Some of you have more than one, that's great. Try to think of at least one. Okay, so rhetorical question for you. Do you have, with your goal in mind that you wrote down, do you have the ability or the talent necessary to achieve it, to get it done? I ask this question to live audiences, and if there's 200 people in the room, 199 hands go up almost all the time. Most times every hand goes up. It is rarely an issue of talent or natural ability that keeps us from achieving what we want. It's mindset. It's mental factors. So to begin our discussion on goals, uh, I thought we'd examine these four mental factors to success. These things are very simple, and most of them are not new to us, but they do have a big impact on what we achieve and also how long it takes us. The first two are very simple. We'll go through them quickly. Second two we'll spend a little bit more time on. So first mental factor, number one, confidence. It's up on the screen there for you for those of you that, that can look. Um, this almost goes without saying, but we're saying it anyway. So if you don't have confidence that, A, you have the ability to achieve something, B, you should achieve it, and C, that you actually deserve to achieve it, that last one, whether or not we deserve it, is something people don't always think about, but it holds people back. If there's no confidence or if there's a lack of confidence, there's a good chance we'll never get started in the achievement process. Now, just to be clear, this is not arrogance 
or overconfidence. That's a whole other issue. But quiet, calm, fact-based confidence that I can achieve what I want. That's the first step. If you don't have that, you won't ever take the action to get started. Number two, mental factor number two, is called success leaves clues. Success leaves clues. Basically, what this principle says, another very simple one, is one of the quickest ways to shorten your path to achieving something new is to find someone who's already done it and learn from them. Copy that person. Figure out the steps they took. There's an old saying, the guy at the top of the mountain didn't fall there. Figure out how they got there. Figure out the steps. Learn from others. So think about the goal that you wrote down, or if if you didn't write it down, that you had in mind when we when we started. Is there someone that you know who's already achieved it? Maybe someone in your circle of friends, uh, family, acquaintances, coworkers? If the answer is yes, and you're serious about achieving it. If you're not serious, you just wrote something down so you could have it, that's one thing. But if you're serious about achieving it, learn from that person, interview them, take them out to lunch, figure out what steps they took, what they did. If you really want the whole story, forget lunch. Take them out for drinks and ask them. Then you'll get every you get stuff you didn't even want to know from the people. Find out what they did, what steps they took, and copy them. Now, this principle, let's take it a step further. I asked, do you know someone who's already achieved it? And some of you probably immediately thought, yes, I do know someone. But other times we have goals, and the answer is no. I actually don't know anybody who's achieved it. There's no one in my circle. Where could you still go to apply this principle? How about the endless array of books, um, videos, and education that's available to us today, especially through the Internet? I I ask this question for live audiences. Where can you go to learn from success? And people say, YouTube, and and everybody laughs. It's so true, though. The amount of information that's available to us today from some of the best people in the world at what they do is incredible. So I'm I'm interested right now in in managing money and investing money, just as an example of this, right? I'm driving home from work today from a workshop. I'm listening to Warren Buffett talk about his investment strategy over the last 65 years. Here's one of the best investors of all time, uh, sorry, of our time, maybe of all time, right? Worth almost $100 billion. And it was like, I can listen to him talk about his strategies for free while I drive probably for hundreds of hours. So it's a resource that's incredible. It's available to us. Yes, learn from those who you know, who are in your circle when it comes to success leaves clues, but also learn from the best in the world. There is a tremendous amount of information available to us. When you even compare it with 10 years ago, what was out there, so many resources. Learn from the best in the world as well. Success leaves clues. Let's go to our third one. Mental factor number three is called what you see is what you get. Now, this deals with the principle of visualization. And if we were to sum it up, basically what this mental factor is saying is the more that you picture a certain result, the more you visualize uh, an achievement or a failure, the greater your chances are of, of having it happen, of it becoming a reality. Now, just to be clear, this is not the law of attraction. I hear a lot of... Um, speakers and authors, they teach the law of attraction. The law of attraction claims, and some of you are familiar with this and have heard of it, but just in case you aren't, let me give you a quick definition. The law of attraction basically claims that there's this invisible force in the universe, and they usually call it the universe, right? And you can literally have anything in the world that you want. You just have to engage the universe through visualization, and it will send that Thing to you eventually. So the law of attraction says you visualize it enough, you put it out there to the universe, you say over and over again, I am a millionaire, I am a millionaire, I am a millionaire, I do have a Ferrari, I do have a, whatever it is, and the universe will send that to you eventually. Now, the question for you, is that 100% true? Is it a law? I don't think so. I mean, it could be, it could be this invisible force out there, but here, here's the thing. The law of attraction, it's not a law. Gravity is a law. I'm sitting in a chair right now. If I fall out of it, I am going to end up on the floor 100% of the time. There's no instance where I'm going to levitate right, up, right above the floor 
I mean, at least we hope not, right? It's a law. It happens every time. The law of attraction is not a law. If it was, we'd all be rock stars and millionaires. However, it is a principle. And the principle behind the law of attraction is very true. And what that principle says is basically the more you focus on something, the more you picture a certain result, the greater the likelihood is that you'll achieve it. Uh, you see professional athletes use visualization. They use this principle all the time. Um, a golfer, a PGA golfer, they stand behind the tee box and they do this big swing with the follow through and they kind of look out over the fairway before they actually hit the ball. They're visualizing it. You see kickers do this in the NFL. Uh, Olympians use this principle of visualization all the time. And it works for them. They're the best in the world at what they do. They meet with success most of the time. How does this apply to you and I and achieving goals? Because most of us here aren't, aren't professional athletes. I know I'm not. Um, to illustrate this, let's do this. Picture yourself in a situation. Let's say that, let's say you're about to um, walk into a really important meeting with somebody. Maybe it's a job interview, interview for a promotion. Um, if you own your own business or you're in some kind of sales, maybe it's a meeting with a potentially huge client. Obviously, we have to prepare know what we're going to say, think about what questions are going to come up. All of that's important. However, there's this moment before you walk in, or sometimes it's the night before, where we're kind of thinking about it, and you have two options, right? You can think of all the great results that could come from it and all the wonderful things that could happen, or everything that could go wrong and every disaster that could possibly happen. Now, where do most people's brains go? Naturally, if you're anything like me, naturally it goes to what could go wrong. And I'm always amazed, by the way, at our creativity when we're thinking of every possible disaster that could happen. It's like, oh, man, what if, the pe what if they hate me? What if nobody likes me? What if I talk too much? Well, what if I don't talk enough? What if, um, oh, man, what if I'm the youngest person in the room? That'd be awkward. Oh, my gosh, what if I'm the oldest person in the room? That'd be even worse. I hope I don't mess up. Oh, my God, I feel nauseous. I feel sick. I hope I don't throw up in front of the group. That'd be even worse. That'd be terrible. And then you think about every other time you've walked into an important meeting and maybe it's gone poorly. If, hopefully you're not that bad. Those were some examples from my mind. Um, but if that's what you think about before you walk in, how do you feel when you get into that meeting? The words that come to my mind are tense, nervous, afraid? Could that affect the way you come across to the people you're meeting with? Absolutely. Could that affect the results and what actually comes from that meeting? 100%. So on the flip side of that, right, if I think about, and I'm not saying it's all positive thinking, too many people out there teach this, but if after realistically preparing, knowing what I'm going to say, having all that stuff figured out, if instead of picturing every disaster that could happen, I think, man, you know what? I don't know how the meeting's going to go, but I'm excited to find out. I'm excited to meet these people. I'm excited to share what happens. I'm, you know what? Honestly, I'm just, I'm excited. I know a lot of good things from com could come from this. I'm excited to see what happens. Well, that's still a realistic viewpoint, but how am I going to come across now? Probably excited. You and I are completely different people when we are excited about something and have some confidence than when we're nervous, tense, afraid, scared. And both things can affect the results. So that's sort of how this principle works, right? It's not the mystical power of the law of attraction and some invisible force in the corner of the universe that sends things our way. Rather, what we focus on, what we think about, and what we visualize actually affects what we do, our actions. And our actions have a direct impact on our results what we achieve. So the, we're kind of getting into our fourth mental factor. So let me just go to it. The three and four are closely related. Number four is called what you see is what you look for. What you see is what you look for. So if the third mental factor is even a little bit true, that what we see is what we get, we have to train our minds to look for the right things. Let me give you an example of this, physical example. Let's say that um, after this webinar is over, you're on your computer or you're on your phone and you're just kind of like uh, on Facebook or whatever, you're surfing the Internet, and you're like, you know what? I think, um, I think I might want a Mercedes. 
gosh, I'm not sure, but I do like them. I've been working hard. And you get on your local dealership's website, and you look at all the different models, and then you pick one that you like, and then you look at used ones for sale, and you read reviews on that model. And then you drive from your office to your house or from your home to the store. What do you see everywhere? Mercedes, they're everywhere. You're like, look, you're like, oh, look at that one. Dude, that, look what he did with the wheels on that one. Look at the color on that one. You start noticing them all over the place. Were they always there? Of course they were. They didn't just all of a sudden show up. How can you never saw them before? Because you weren't looking for them. So the reason why this happens in a physical sense is because of something called your reticular activating system, or RAS for short. And basically what it is, it's a giant filter. Uh, anytime our eyes are open, especially when we're driving, it's a good example, we're confronted with so much information. The brain basically, through the RAS, reticular activating system, chooses what we see and what we don't see. Now, how is this applied to achieving goals? Because we don't really care about the number of Mercedes on, on the road. It's, it's just an illustration. Well, think about it this way. Do you know someone who a certain area of their life is not where they want it to be, could be career or physical, financial. Um, and instead of taking ownership of it and figuring out what they can do differently, they look for every excuse as to why it's someone else's fault and look for others to blame. Now, it's not that they're a bad person, but just in this certain area of life, it's not worked out and they've looked for excuses. They look for excuses. What do they seem to find? Everywhere. Excuses, right? Real, legitimate excuses. It's everything from it's my family's fault, it's uh, my boss's fault, well, it's the way I was raised, well, it's the economy's bad. I mean, how am I supposed to do well? Uh, you know whose fault it is? It's the president. Man, if the, if the Democrats would just get back in office, or, uh, goodness, if the Republicans would just take office, things would be different. They look for excuses, and they're everywhere. Real, legitimate, existing excuses. Take, uh, take the other side of that equation. Do you know someone who's very opportunity focused? They look for opportunities. What do they seem to find everywhere? Opportunities, right? And they grow and they grow. It's like people like that, they'll start in one industry, one business, and they go right to the top and then they, they go, you know what? Um, I got this job offer over here or I'm going to start this business. And they start back at the bottom and where do they end up? Right up to the top. I used to hate people like that. <laughs> Couldn't stand them. I'd look at them and go, gosh, you're so lucky. Everything they touch turns to gold. They weren't lucky. Sure, they might have got a good break along the line somewhere, but it's a mindset. They've trained themselves to look for the right thing. So I'm, this, this principle of what you see is what you look for, it can kind of impact us in a little bit of a different way too. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and just assume that most of you on this call are not excuse oriented type people i mean the session's called achievement now success characteristics usually people who are looking for excuses don't they don't make their way into a session called achievement now success characteristics however this principle can still affect us in a little bit of a different way and to illustrate that we're going to play a game um those of you that are able to give your attention to the uh the slides here all right, lost my place. Where am I at? All right, there we go. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to um, flash a statement up on the slide and uh, for the presentation. And it's just one sentence. Just read it, and, and I'm read it through once. And then once I feel enough time going by for everyone to have read it through once, I'm going to take it off the screen, and I'm going to ask you a question. All right, so here's the statement. Hopefully those of you that are in front of a computer looking at it on your phone can see it. There we go. All right, and we're taking it off. Profound statement, right? <laughs> um, this is a, a rhetorical question, but can any of you tell me exactly word for word what that sentence said without missing even one word? I asked this for live audiences, and in five years of giving this presentation, actually with live audiences, I offer, pull out a $50 bill, and offer $50 to anyone who can tell me this, this sentence word for word without looking. 
I've yet to have anyone get it the first time. It's probably because I didn't give you anything to look for. I purposefully gave you no instructions virtually. I just said, hey, I'm going to flash this thing up on the screen, read it, and then we'll see what happens. Would it help you if I gave you something to look for? This time, we're going to do the exact same thing, about the same amount of time. But as you read this statement, count the number of times you see the letter F in this statement. Ready? Here we go. All right, I think that was long enough. So what's your number? I ask this uh, for live audiences, and I hear every answer between two and seven. Same statement, same people looking at it. Ooh, we got some, thank you for throwing the, the uh, chats up there. We got some sixes, we got a seven, we got a two and a three, <laughs> four, four. <laughs> A lot of sevens. We got some creative folks here. <laughs> the correct number six. There's six Fs on the card, or on the sorry, on the statement. Let me bring it back up so you can see it. Um, if you didn't get six, look for the little word of. The reason why this happens is because of something called a scotoma. And uh, basically what a scotoma is, I'm sorry, I'm reading your guys' comments. I sound distracted. It's because I am. Um, <laughs> a, a scotoma is a blind spot caused by some kind of previous conditioning. The reason why there's so many discrepancies in this number um, is usually because of that little word of, right? Phonetically, it is said like a V. However, it has an F in it. So this is an instance where people are looking for the right things, but still, they scan right over it because of this blind spot caused by some kind of previous conditioning. Again, in this case, it was phonetics. We don't care about the number of Fs on a card when it comes to real life. Sorry, it's six. I see some of you still throwing question marks out there. Six Fs, leaving it up there so you can count them. Um, again, this was just an example, just an illustration. We, we're not really worried about the number of Fs on a card. But my question is, can something similar happen um, when it comes to trying to achieve? Like, man, I'm looking for all the right things. I am focused. Hey, I'm not an excuse-oriented type person, like you said at the outset. I'm opportunity-focused. I'm trying to achieve. And still, something's missing. There's a good chance it's because of something similar, some kind of blind spot caused by previous conditioning. Now, when it comes to achievement, this previous conditioning many times comes in the form of limiting belief systems or belief barriers that hold people back. Now, we could talk about belief systems, belief barriers for hours. I mean, there's speakers that talk about limiting belief systems for days. But just kind of a rhetorical question for you. Can you think of any belief systems that hold people back from achieving? Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I just realized you were hearing the word S. There's a letter S, and it was actually an F. Sorry about that. Well, that's why there were so many sevens. <laughs> well, I guess that was a big flop. At least we tried. <laughs> um, limiting belief systems have a tendency to hold people back from achieving what they want, right? Even if they're well-intentioned and they want to work hard, if there's this underlying belief system or blind spot it can, it can hold you back from achieving. So just a few examples of this, right? Um, some people have the belief system of, man, I'm just not good enough to achieve what I want. I don't have the right education. I don't have enough money to achieve. I don't have enough time. Well, this is how I've always been. So why should I change? Or, hey, man, I've failed a bunch of times in the past. It's probably not going to work. Belief systems like that create blind spots, just like what happened with this, uh, exercise that we attempted to do. And blind spots can hold us back from achieving what we want. So just to illustrate this, let's take an example here. One of the most common belief systems that I hear people say that hold them back from achieving is, I don't have enough time. 
like, man, I want to uh, get in shape or I want to uh, build a business or I want to grow my career, but I just don't have enough time. Now, have you ever said that? I know I have. Like, I've said it thousands of times in my life, probably. The interesting thing about belief systems is they're true on some level and they're untrue, right? So is this one true on some level? Yes, we're all busy. We've got a lot going on. But how do I know that it's not 100% true? I don't have enough time. Well, first of all, I'd probably find time for the things I really want. They're important to me. And secondly, we all have the same amount of time. I mean, it's the great equalizer. So, like, the most productive person in the world and the least productive person in the world have the exact same 24 hours every day. I mean, me and Warren Buffett have the same 24 today. So let's just take this as an example, right? Let's say I have a goal of I want to start a business. It's just an example. I, don't have, it's, I already have a business, but my goal is, man, I want to start this business. But my belief system is I just don't have enough time. I'm saying it over and over again. It's what I genuinely believe. Don't have enough time. Don't have enough time. What's the case with my goal to start a business? I'm probably never even going to get started because I've got this core belief that's creating a blind spot, right? What if my belief system, I have the same exact goal, but I just have a tiny shift. People talk about massive bombardment and confronting your subconscious and all that stuff. We're not even going there. This is a tiny shift in belief systems. So instead of saying I don't have enough time, my belief now is, you know what? I am busy. I've got a lot going on. But, I mean, other people have done it. I just got to figure it out. I mean, same, me and Warren Buffett, same 24. I, I just, it's a matter of priorities, not time. Well, just by that tiny shift in belief system, what do I create now? An opportunity. I still may fail. It's not a guarantee, but I've at least got a chance. One belief system keeps me from even starting. The other one gives me a shot at achieving what I want. So belief systems, uh, they're simple. We usually acquire them when we are very young. So sometimes we're not even aware we have them. And they're always true on some level. The question is not, is my belief system true or is it false? The question is, is it leading me closer to my goals or is it creating blind spots? Is it holding me back? Especially if the goal you wrote down or thought of at the beginning of this thing is something you tried to achieve before, um, I can tell you there's a very good chance some kind of blind spot possibly holding you back. So those are the four mental factors. Uh, confidence, success leaves clues, what you see is what you get, what you see is what you look for. I want to talk about two very simple practices that anyone can do. They take very little time. They don't cost any money and uh, have a big impact on the mindset to achievement and also the, uh, the likelihood as to whether or not we'll achieve what we want. So, sorry, I keep losing my spot here on the slide. All right, so two simple practices. I know you've heard both of these before. And these are two things that have had a huge impact uh, on me personally. Number one, practice gratitude. Practice gratitude. What is practice gratitude? Well, it's almost defined in the statement, right? It's the deliberate act or practice of regularly showing gratitude. Now, there's a lot of ways to do this. I know some people who force themselves to send an email to someone once a week, just out of the blue thanking them. It could be someone from their past. could be someone they work with. That's a way to practice gratitude. I used to tell audiences to get this thing called a gratitude journal. And some of you have heard of this before. Basically, what a gratitude journal is, is uh, I would tell people, look, go buy a little blank journal, uh, put it next to your bed, and every morning when you wake up, write down a list of 20 things that you're thankful for. Get up a couple minutes early and write down this list of things that you're, that you're thankful for. It'll really help you with your mindset. Now, that's a great habit, but how many people out of the thousands that I told to do that around the country do you think actually walked out of my speech, went to the store, or got on Amazon, ordered a journal, put it next to their bed, got up five minutes early, and wrote down a list of things they were thankful for? Out of thousands, maybe a half dozen. That might be generous. Uh, here's a simpler way to do this. Basically the same effect, but something that every one of us can do. Uh, how many of you have some kind of commute to work every day, whether it's 10 minutes or two hours. I do this every single day on my drive to work. I force myself to say out loud 10 simple things that I'm thankful for, that I'm grateful for. They don't have to be elaborate. Um, 
In fact, sometimes the more basic they are, the more you appreciate them. But it really does affect mindset. Here's the way I think of it. How many of us have at least one problem that we're currently facing right now? Probably all. Pretty young. I would think you have more than one. Uh, how many of us have at least one thing that we're thankful for or grateful for? All of us. If you spend all of your time focusing on and thinking about our problems, what kind of mindset does it create? Problem mentality. Uh, how many of us have that friend that, like, you're almost afraid to ask them how they're doing because you know that half an hour later, what will you still be doing? You'll still be listening. They've created a – it's not – again, they're not a bad person, but they've created a problem mentality, and it's snowball. It's created more problems. If I take a portion of my time and spend it on thinking about deliberately the things I'm thankful for, grateful for, it creates a different mindset. And just to throw this out there, uh, I'm not naturally an optimist. There's a lot of speakers who talk about this, and, and they're like, oh, my goodness, I wake up every morning, and I'm so happy to greet the day. And I, I start out, I, I stretch for 20 minutes, and then I do yoga, and then I do my gratitudes, and then I run five miles, and then I drink two kale smoothies and a gallon of water, and then I go to work, and I feel amazing. I, I'm, <laughs> I wish I was one of those people, but I'm not by nature. Um, that's why this principle is even more important. So let me just give you an example. Uh, not long ago, I was uh, going to Richmond for a presentation, and I live in northern Maryland, about an hour north of Baltimore. So I have to go all the way down 95. It's about a four-hour drive. It was a weird time. It was like an 11 a.m. presentation. I've been on the road all week, so I decided, you know what? I'm not going to go to the hotel. I'm just going to drive down in the morning, get up early, and make the drive. So I leave my house at like 4 in the morning just in case there's traffic. And if you know your geography, you know, if I go down 95, I have to go through D.C., to get from my house to Richmond, some of the worst traffic in the country. So come 7.30, I am still just planted on 495 D.C. Traffic's not moving at all, and I'm trying to get to this presentation. Am I a happy person at this point? Absolutely not. I hate mornings. I hate traffic. I'm sitting there, and I go, ah, oh, crap, I haven't done my gratitudes yet. Man. Do I want to do them? Absolutely not. But I think, well, I mean, I teach people to do this. I guess I better do it. What do I have to be thankful for? Um, oh, man. Well, I mean, at least I'm not in the accident that caused this thing. That's good. Um, let's see. What else? I'm thankful for my friends, my family, my wife. I'm thankful I have work. I'm thankful for the, the presentation I had to give today. Uh, what else? I'm thankful. Oh, you know what? I read something the other night. Worldwide, every evening. 80,000 people die in their sleep. They don't wake up the next day. Man, I wasn't one of them last night. I mean, I mean that's good, right? Slowly, by about number seven or eight on the gratitude list, what starts to happen to me? Mindset shift. So much to my dismay, <laughs> I dismay, by the way, start to have a little shift in mindset. So here's the way I think of this. I cannot control all the aspects of my life. I can't control exactly how I feel when I wake up. I, the nature of my business, I travel a lot. I can't always control how much sleep I get. What I can control is when I show up to work, to a meeting, or to be with friends or family, whatever it is, I want to show up in the best possible state that I can with what I've got that day, and practice gratitude helps me to do that. Um, here, here's what I ask. If you've never tried this or if you used to do it and you got out of the habit, just give it a try. Try it. Uh, today on your way home from work if you're not home already, or try it Monday when you're driving to work. Just 10 simple things. Say them out loud while you drive. If, if you hate it and you think it's stupid, never have to do it again. If you like it and it shifts your mindset a little bit, then make it a habit. All right, practice number two. I know you've heard this one before. Write down your goals. Write down your goals. So we have been told this. If you're anything like me, you've been told this since grade school. I never wrote down my goals. In fact, I don't know that I ever wrote down a single goal until about six years ago. I was reading an article in uh, Forbes magazine, and I'll just share the short version of it with you. It changed my mind about writing down goals. If you want to read the full, full study, just Google Forbes written goal study. You can read the whole thing. So the study began in 1979, and they took the graduating class of Harvard MBAs. So some of the brightest minds in the world, so they say. Um, 79, graduating class, Harvard MBAs. They asked them a very simple question. The question was, do you have your goals 
written down? What percentage of them do you think did? 3%. That number surprised me. I thought, man, Harvard MBA grads, these are like future CEOs of the world. You would think 90% of them would have their goals written down. Only 3% actually had their goals written down. Ten years later, they took the same group and they asked, so this is 89, 10 years down the road, 10 years after graduation, they asked them another very simple question. The question was, how much money do you make a year? Percentage-wise, how much more do you think the 3% three, the 3 that had their goals written down was making than the other 97 per year? A thousand percent is what the study found. Ten times. Now, I don't know. Uh, some of you may have heard this before, right? But the, the first time I heard this, um, I'm sitting there and I'm reading it, and I'm just kind of like, well, I mean, I, I guess I ought to start writing down my goals. I don't, I don't know, I don't know what else to do. Um, we we talk about this all the time. People say, well, yeah, I I heard um, I heard that that study was was incorrect. I heard that actually the number got skewed because um, one of the one of the participants became CEO very young, and they got this like $30 million bonus that year, and that's what made that number so high. Uh, someone else told me, I actually, I heard that one of the um, participants' uh, parents both died in an accident, and they had this huge inheritance that year, and that's what made the number so high. Who cares? Hey, the number was 1,000%, right? But what if the number was 50% or 20% instead of 1,000? How long does it take to write down your goals? I mean, if you only got one or two, it doesn't take long, right? If you've got more, just a couple minutes. How much money does it cost? How hard is it? It's easy. It's easy. So, you know, rhetorical question, but do I have my goals for 2018 written down, place somewhere where I can see them? If, if the answer to that question is no, I can tell you what one of the first things I'd do uh, when I put down the phone would be. It was one of the first things I did when I – when I read that study. So those are the two very simple practices. Practice gratitude, write down your goals. They're things anybody can do. They, they cost very little, mo they, they don't cost any money, sorry, and they cost very little time. And they have a huge impact on, on focus and on achievement. So let's, let's now revisit um, the goals that you wrote down at the beginning. Look back to them if you wrote them down or if you just had them in your mind, just refer to it. We said the number one reason why people fail to achieve what they want is they sacrifice what they want most for what they want right now. Another big reason why people fail to achieve is what they consider to be goals don't actually qualify as such. So we're going to examine uh, the characteristics of a goal. And if you've heard of SMART goals before, this will be similar to that. We've got a couple things that uh, I think are missing from SMART goals. So as we go through these, think back to the goal that you set at the beginning and kind of think, hey, does this check all the boxes or is there room for me to maybe adjust a little bit? Number one, first characteristic, the goal must be meaningful to you. This is probably the most important part of the whole thing because, honestly, if a goal is not meaningful to you, you probably won't be willing to make the sacrifices to get it done. In fact, how do I know if a goal is meaningful to me? Two things that I always think of, am I willing to make sacrifices? Am I willing to start now? If I'm not willing to do those two things, it's probably not that meaningful. So just to illustrate this, um, let's kind of – I'll paint you a picture here. Let's say that um, you and I are in the same room and in the same area, and I had a 2 by 10 board, like 2 inches thick, 10 inches wide, kind of like a rafter, and it's like 30 feet long. So it's a big, long board, 2 by 10, and I set it flat on the ground. So the 10-inch side is flat on the ground. 30 foot long board. And I stand at the other side and I tell you, hey, if you walk across this board, it's on the floor, 10 inches wide, I'll give you $100 cash when you get to the other side. Would you do it? Most people say yes. 10 inches wide, I'm not going to fall off. On the ground, there's no risk. Sure, easy $100. What if I took the same board and I put it between two 50 story buildings and I stood at the other side and I was like, hey, I got 100 bucks. You want to walk across? Most people would. Now, it's the same board, but we're not willing to do it. What if we take that same situation, and there's two 50-story buildings, and there's a board between them, 
you're on the top of one, and the other building is on fire, and one of your kids is on the top of it, or your spouse, or someone very close to you, and the only way you can save them is to walk over and bring them back. Would you do it? Most of us wouldn't even think about it. We'd do it, right? And I wouldn't have to give you $100. What changed? The meaning changed, right? The mechanics are still exactly the same. It's still two 50-story buildings. It's still a two-by-ten board, 30 feet long. But when the meaning changes, we're willing to do something that we weren't before. So meaningful to you, it's the first step. If a goal's not meaningful, we, we probably won't be willing to put in the work to achieve it. Number two, must be the right size. Goals that are too big tend to terrify people. They won't get started. And goals that are too small don't really make anything of you when you achieve them. Now, just to be clear, just because a goal is too big for right now doesn't mean it's too big, period. I might just need some, some little things in between, uh, kind of stepping stone goals to get there. I know if a goal is the right size, if I set it and I feel excited and nervous at the same time. Both of those feelings mixed together, uh, it's probably the right size. If I look at the goal and it's just like sheer terror, it's probably too big. If I look at it and go, oh, man, I got that. That's no problem. It might not be big enough. It has to be the right size. Number three, this is where a lot of people fall short, specific and dated. A goal must be specific and it must have a date on it. So, first of all, specific, right? I want to make more money. I want to get in better shape. I want to improve my relationships. I want to, my, this is one of my favorite ones. My goal is I want to become a better person. I just want to be a better person. Well, that's a good idea, and it's a great starting point, but what does that look like? How will you know when you've gotten there? Goal has to be specific. Also dated, right? Think, think about this. If, uh, if your boss comes in this afternoon or Monday morning and they bring you this project, right, and they say, here it is, they put it on your desk, they tell you what you need to do and give you the whole uh, description of it, and they say, here it is, what's your question? When does it need to be done? Always the question, right? And they say, oh, I mean, you know, I'm, uh, when, whenever. I mean, there's no, you know, just, just – it doesn't matter. I mean, whenever, really, whenever. What happens to the project? It just sits there. We never get it done. It's the same way with goals. If there's not a date on it, a deadline, there's a good chance that it just sits there and we don't, we don't achieve it. Number four, it must be written down. We talked about this one already. Uh, it's the Harvard study, so we won't talk about that more, but it's important to write it down. Number five, must be reviewed. So how often should I review my goals? Depends on the nature of it, right? Some people, uh, if I have a goal to walk 10 miles a week, I should probably review that every week or every couple days, right? If I have a goal to pay off my 30-year mortgage in 22 years, well, I don't need to review that every couple days. I'll drive myself crazy. But effective goals should be reviewed to uh, make sure you're, you're staying on track. So we've got the five, right? These are the five characteristics. Think back to the goal that you wrote down at the beginning or that you had in mind at the beginning. Does it check all these boxes, especially the first three, right, because the last two are kind of on you to do? Um, is, it, is it meaningful, first of all? Is it the right size? Does it kind of make you excited and nervous at the same time? And the one that a lot of people miss, is it specific? Does it have a date or a deadline on it? If not, I encourage you make a, a small adjustment, make sure it's the right size, it's meaningful, and give yourself a deadline. This so greatly increases the chances of, uh, of achieving it. And then if you haven't already, write it down and place it somewhere where you can see it. So as we uh, wrap up our, our workshop here, I want to just finish up by talking about these three characteristics of achievement. And uh, we'll conclude with these three. So we've talked about mental factors. We've talked about practices. These are characteristics of, of high achievers. Number one, fully focused. Successful people, high achievers, they have this laser-like focus on what it is they want to get done, what it is they want to achieve. Sometimes it borders on obsession. They're so focused, right? Now, from an achievement side, yes, it's extremely important. Also, just from a life side in general, fully focused is a huge issue. So one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself, the people you work with, your family, your friends, the people you spend time with, is this full level of focus and mental presence 
to the task at hand. This becomes more and more challenging all the time because it seems like we have more going on. Our phones buzz every five seconds. It's just a challenge to be fully focused. This is something I struggle with. In fact, let me, let me share what I noticed about myself. I noticed this about three years ago. Um, so for my business, there's really busy times of year and there's, there's slower times. The busiest times are uh, February to June and September till the holidays. So this is, this is the fall, just this example. Um, and, and over Thanksgiving every year, my wife and I go to Key West for, for two weeks. So September comes, busy season. First couple of weeks are great. Excited to be back and, and everything, you know, back at events and conferences. It's awesome. Traveling all over the place, right? By about the middle of October, how do I start to feel? Worn out, exhausted, tired. So I'm, I'm driving around. I'm going to these events. I'm speaking at conferences. I'm flying. Uh, I'm working with local companies doing workshops. I'm traveling all over the place and working, but what am I thinking about the whole time? Key West. I'm like, man, I can't wait to get to Key West. I can't wait. I'm so tired. I just can't wait. Um, I'm like uh, in my hotel room before a speech, and instead of practicing like I should be, I'm reading fishing reports from Key West because, you know, that's what I do when I get there, and I'm just like, I'm just, I'm focused on it. Here's the, the, the zinger to this. As soon as I get on vacation, holidays come, Key West, what am I thinking about the whole time? work the whole time. So I'm not as good as I could be at work because I'm thinking about vacation, and I'm terrible at vacation because I'm thinking about work the whole time. Now, what sense does that make? Fully focused, mental presence. Uh, it not only helps with achievement, but it's one of the best gifts you can give the people around you. Number two, brilliant with basics. Brilliant with basics. Not just good with basics, brilliant. How many things do you have to be brilliant at to be successful? Most times just one. Sometimes it's three or four, but it's never 60. It's never 100. What do I need to be brilliant at to, and, and it really ties in with focus, right? What do I need to focus on to become brilliant at to achieve in the areas of life that I want to? And uh, let me go to the third one here because I, I want to leave a, a couple minutes for Q&A. Number three, aggressive mental care aggressive mental care. This principle basically says, that, sorry, principle basically says that all of your input into your brain, everything from the TV shows we watch to the books we read to the, the things we read on Facebook to uh, who we hang out with, who we spend the majority of our time with, all of that input affects our output. So, I'm not saying you have to get rid of all your loser friends if you want to achieve more, but everything that we, all, all of our input sources affect what we do. Here's a question. How many books, nonfiction, does the average American read per year after their last formal year of education, whether it's high school or college? Average is one. Uh, I think it was 38% of Americans report zero. They never read another book after their last year of education. How many books, nonfiction, does the average Fortune 500 CEO read per year? 60. Found that number hard to believe. 60. Five a month. So that's a big divide, right? If success really does leave clues, what should you and I be trying to do? Read more. Take in more information. Uh, Warren Buffett, as I told you at the beginning, I was listening to him. One of the things he said, uh, he was talking about what's made him successful, and they asked him, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? You guess is what he said? He said, well, I wish I could speed read. I just can't take in information fast enough. Man, here's a guy at the end of his life worth almost $100 billion, and he doesn't say x-ray vision. He doesn't say, I wish I could fly. He says, I, I just can't learn. I can't take in information fast enough. It's got to be worth something. Uh, aggressive mental care. So I'm not saying you have to, you know, hang up from this webinar and decide to read 60 books this year. But could I read two this year if I only read one professional development or a nonfiction book last year? Could I try to re read one a quarter? Small things can make a big difference. And that's really what I want to conclude with. Um, we'll finish up here with a quote by Jim Rohn, the uh, speaker. He's one of my favorites of all time. Passed away a few years ago. But he had a way of taking complex things and making them simple. And he does that with his definition of success. He said, you want to know the definition of what makes people successful? There's all these definitions. People want it to be some huge event, 
some massive action. He said, Here, here's the definition of success long term. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. He said, that's it. Everyone wants to overcomplicate it. It's not. It's a few simple disciplines practiced every day over time. He continued, you want the definition of failure? A few simple neglects practiced every day. And it's the practiced every day part that makes it happen over, over the long term, right? So simple disciplines, right? The things we talked about today, they're, they're simple. They're not new to most of us. We've heard them before. They're also easy to do. It's easy to write down your goals. It's easy to practice gratitude. Uh, it's easy to try to read an extra book this year. The problem is things that are easy to do are just as easy not to do, just as easy to let go. So something to think about as we finish up here. Hopefully you're thinking about your goals, your personal goals that you wrote down. Um, but also, what are my simple disciplines that I have in place that I do every day? Can I reinforce them and make sure I keep them up? Do I have any simple neglects that I've let slip in? And where will I be in five years, ten years, if I keep those neglects up? Again, it can be positive, hey, I want to continue this, or it can be negative, I need to change this. But I hope that from today's brief presentation, you'll take a few small things that, that you can use and implement to start achieving the things you want. Thank you guys again for your time. Uh, I guess we'll turn it back over to Alyssa. Does anybody have any questions for Tyler? I'll give you guys just a few seconds um, to see if anybody's going to type any questions in the chat box. All right. Um, thank you for attending today's webinar. The recording will be distributed to all registrants through email. If you attended today's webinar as a non-member, please inquire about membership opportunities through your local MGMA chapter. At the conclusion of this webinar, you will be sent a brief survey that will ask you to rate the webinar on a five-star scale. A separate survey will be sent to your email for a more in-depth look at today's program. And that concludes our webinar. Thank you again for attending and have a great